Okay, here we go. Pink glue, September 29th, 2020, discernment, the art of knowing the truth. This is episode 121. Now, going into the presidential debate this evening, I decided to refresh my mind on what discernment is. As you saw, episode 120 was related to deep fake as relates to uh, both photographs and videos. And there was a saying that I had heard years ago, and I didn't quite find it here, but it said something about uh, believe half of what you hear and none of what you see or the other way around, half of what you see and none of what you hear. And it, it's really kind of fallen out of our educational system to teach discernment and, and rational thinking. Uh, from a strategy uh, perspective. So uh, I thought that I would delve into this. And what is interesting is we go through these different different tabs that I've set up, the discernment comes from a religious perspective. I'm not seeing it from an educational or a university or a, I'm, I'm finding a lot of overrun with religion, which is interesting on its own, but a lot of life lessons apparently can come from that direction. So here we go. Pink Lou presenting Discernment, Art of Knowing the Truth, Episode 121. And as always, I just want to take a moment to just give you gratitude. Thank you very, very much for, for listening and following and the feedback. I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Okay, discernment. So discernment, the ability to judge well. An astonishing lack of discernment. Well, that's interesting is number one. Okay, number two. In Christian context, perception in the absence of judgment with a view to obtaining spiritual guidance and understanding. Without providing for a time of healing and discernment, there will be no hope of living through this present moment without a shattering of our common life. So these were presented by Oxford Dictionaries. So the ability to judge well. Um, here's spiritual discernment. Spiritual discernment is calling on the Holy Spirit to lead or give direction on a matter. It is how the Spirit shows the church or its people what God wants them to do and be. There is discernment of one, gifts, two, spirits, three, actions, four, intents, five, the courses of the times we live in. Discernment is more than just a skill. Discernment is a gift from God before it is anything else. Yet there are clearly skills you can put to use when using your gift and you can become better at it through. And it'll continue there. I'm not going to click on that. But it does have here, what is discernment? Six ways to grow mo more discerning. And that is uh, right here on ibelieve.com, uh, what is discernment, six ways to grow more discerning. This is presented by Jessica Van Rokel, crosswalk.com contributing writer. And this was a year ago in August, so not too distant. Which way do I go? Okay, so here we go. Let's just read a, a, just a quick amount of this. Um, Every Christian should know in discernment. It is discernment that enables us to tell the difference between right and wrong. Spiritual discernment is a shield against spiritual deception. Without discernment, we would be adrift in an ocean of differing viewpoints and pitted against one another. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9, Solomon asks for a discerning heart so that he could lead God's people and to distinguish between right and wrong. He went on to lead the Israelites through a time of peace and wrote much of Proverbs. Yet he failed to discern the risks that having too many wives and concubines would bring to his life. As wise as Solomon was, he is flawed. Example, he's a flawed example of discernment. But Jesus is the ultimate example of discernment. John chapter 2 verses 24 to 25 shows us that he knows all men and the contents of their hearts. So how do we gain discernment? God ties discernment to spiritual maturity, and spiritual maturity links to wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Discernment is the acuteness of understanding. It is a spiritual gift as well as something to grow in. 
As a spiritual gift, it gives us special circumstances so that God's will is fulfilled in mo the moment. As a skill, it is grown over time as one studies and applies God's word. Okay, so there's more here if, if you want to look at that. Um, it and there obviously, as I mentioned leading into this, all the the um, search engine results came up from a religious perspective. But as a as a human being, you know, we're we're told whether somebody believes in reincarnation or not, or karma or not. There's a little bit of that 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 bleeds into our society, and having an opportunity to come back and do something again gives us an opportunity to look at it from a different perspective. So let me give a quick um, example. Let's say that um, you, you move from one country to another and the new, new country has basketball, the other country did not. And the, the friends that you've acquired in your new location play on a basketball team and maybe you haven't even seen basketball on TV. Well, the first day that you run out there and play basketball with them, there, there's going to be a, a lot of um, not quite sure what's happening, not knowing the rules, um, not sure why there's how many people on one team and how many on the other and when to pass the ball, when to hold it, when not to run with it, when to throw it, at what are points. You know, there's a lot there. But let's say by day two you come back, you, you have the basics down, your mind is oriented to what's going on, and so you can let settle some of the basics and start fine tuning more into the strategy. Well, that, that opportunity to let the basics settle and start deciphering what a strategy can be is applying also a level of discernment as to how you're going to approach that. Now, that's a, a very um, simple, non-secular non way of looking at this. But let's say in a work environment, the first time something... Uh, positive or negative occurs in a work environment, we're usually shocked. Now, whether or not somebody comes in and wishes us happy birthday, there might be a level of embarrassment or shock or attention on, on, um, on, on you that, that may, might not have been um, expected. Or maybe a coworker um, if they pulls a prank on you. And it, it's something that you had not expected. And there's a level of shock. Well, that the, the brain will sort through these actions and try to figure out what are all the possible scenarios that could have happened and what are the different scenarios that you could work on. So I recall when I was, oh, maybe about kindergarten, I would lay in bed at night and I would run through all the conversations I had in that day. And I would practice in my mind speaking so that I could respond faster and that I could uh, be a better listener in order to participate more to be called on in the classroom. I also remember about that same age, in my mind, I would run through scenarios that I was taught during the day. So one of the scenarios was how to tie a, 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 a bow on my shoelaces. And at night, I would just lay there and imagine tying that. And by going through these practices and relearning these drills of what I'd been presented during the day, my ability to move past the basics and get to discernment moved a lot faster. So I was able to identify opportunities, identify strategies, and, and although this, this word is, you know, has its own connotations, the naiveness was able to step aside because I was more able to search for better questions to get better quality answers in order to make better quality decisions. So again, this was, let me just click back on this again, six ways to grow more discerning and let me just highlight them, gain knowledge, apply understanding, grow in wisdom, receive God's anointing, experience God's grace, and grow in maturity. So that's what was presented in this article. And again, as always, I'll leave the, the link below. And then here we have reviveourhearts.com. And this is presented by Nancy DeMoss uh, Wolgamuth. And apparently can download a, a PDF as well. The title is Learn to Discern, How to Recognize and Respond to Error in Culture. And I am, as always, I'm looking for a, a 
date. And let's see if there's something posted at the bottom of this one. Okay, not seeing a date here. But I will, of course, put the link there if you want to grab it. So the enemy of truth is subtle and cunning. We should not be surprised by the increase in lies and spiritual error as we near the return of Christ. The Bible says this will happen. Matt 2411. And God wants us to be aware of false teachings and teachers so that we can stand firm in his word. We must be discerning and not simply accept what people say is true. Be discerning. Learn to discern between truth and error. Wisdom is the application of the truth of scripture in our lives. James 1, 5. And God wants us to ask for wisdom, but discernment takes that one step further. Discernment is the ability to judge or distinguish between two things using the wisdom of God's word. The kind of judging is not wrong. Indeed, it is crucial if we are to make wise decisions. So it continues here, and of course you can link back to it. The next is be alert. Notice the corrupting pull of the culture. The Bible instructs us to walk circumspectly, looking around, not as fools, but as wise, because the days are evil, and to understand what the will of the Lord is, Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. In other words, we need to be alert. We must be aware of the error of it we encounter in literature, the news, and other media. We need to increase in the knowledge of God and his truth so we will have his wisdom and spiritual understanding. 1, 9 to 10. And let's look at the next one here. Be biblical. Know and teach the truth and show it in your life. Bank workers study genuine money, not counterfeit bills, so they will recognize bogus money. Similarly, if we want to recognize wolves in sheep's clothing, we must know what a true sheep looks like because evil disguises itself as truth. And remember, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. We must study God's word so we can quickly recognize error. Even in some evangelical churches, people are not being taught the whole counsel of God. It's important to anchor our lives in God's character. 2 Peter 1, 3. And know his standards for unchanging truth, so we will not be cast adrift by the empty, always changing philosophies of the world. 2 Timothy 2.15 God does not want us to be spiritual babies. He wants us to be mature in Christ, so we will not be tossed to and fro. You know, these last 10 years for me, as I've spoken about in, in other episodes, have really been... A, a challenge and a decline and as as we get out in the world we realize it's not just happening to us during the last economic da downturn a lot of individuals had to rethink their lives shuffle their careers and find a uh, earth to stand on and it's been very interesting the culture in the workforce has shifted quite a bit too where we've been told that you have to be dedicated to the workforce you show that you want to be here, um, you know, all the things that an employee must do. And yet on the employer side, there is, what we have seen is the first to go are the employees. And in order to make that even easier, they classify them as contractors and vendors rather than FTEs in order to cut the slack even easier and reduce any kind of responsibility is what it boils down to for any benefits um, for today or benefits for hope of a retirement. The next one, be courageous. Identify and expose the words, works of darkness. God wants us to defend the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1, by exposing lies. We must identify the sources of error that may be influencing our lives and or the lives of those we love. Perhaps it's a cult or new age rethinking or theological errors. 1 John 4, 11 instructs us to test the spirits, attempting to determine whether they are from God, whatever their words, whether they are spoken by preachers, 
teachers, psychologists, authors, talk show hosts, or radio speakers. All teachings are to be judged by the eternal word of God. John 17, 17b. And they go into additional scriptures to follow there. Be prayerful. Intercede for those caught in Satan's snare. Prayer is often the forgotten element in the battle against false teachings. Beyond gently and firmly sharing the truth, we can pray from a heart of compassion and concern that God will correct those who are in opposition and grant their repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Be proactive. Protect yourself against the poison of error. There's no such thing as a safe dose, dose of poison, so we must be careful about what we allow to enter our lives. It is wise to surround ourselves and those we love with a clear understanding of what God teaches in his word. After we pray for protection, we can stand firm with the belt of truth. Ephesians 6, 14a. In fact, we should put on the whole armor of God, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers of this dark world. Ephesians 6, 12 to 17. And here's some scriptures for being proactive. So there's the article again. Uh, definitely, once again, as you could tell from the site, that it was a religious slant. Uh, but the basic notion, again, be discerning, be alert, um, and and maybe a biblical is not uh, the path that, that you have chosen or, or that you have followed, uh, but no history. Uh, un be somebody who understands the past and how it relates to the future. Be courageous. And again, prayer. Not everybody is at, at the point where they have this comfortable relationship and are focusing in prayer. But what I have found is ask and thou shalt receive. So even if it's a meditation, if it's quiet time, even if it's um, just a, a con um, conscious writing, get out a pen and paper and ask a question. And one trick that was shown to me when I was a child was the water trick. And I think I recently learned it came from the Silva method, but I, I'm not positive on that. But um, you just get a glass and fill it with water whatever whatever you want you know halfway what however big the glass is just and then right before you get in bed you think of a question and then you drink half of the amount of liquid that's in that glass so you don't want to drink too much if you don't want to go to the restroom so you'll, you'll figure out what is the right amount for you so you've got your question in your mind and it might be something like um i have two job offers uh, please guide me uh to to be clear on which one i could choose or it could be something um, simple as um, what time should I set up the meeting tomorrow? You know, any spectrum. Ask yourself a question, drink half of the amount of water you have in the glass and set the other half right next to your bed. And then through the night, your subconscious mind will work on finding a solution. They will, it'll look from many different aspects. It'll ask for guidance, you know, whatever your beliefs are around that. But the amazing thing is, when you wake up, you take the, the drink the rest of the water. And what is absolutely incredible is as you're drinking the water, the answer will come to you. And so if you have pen and paper there, that's even better because sometimes we wake up in the middle of the night, you might drink the water, the prayer or the answer comes right to you. You can write it down and then review it in the morning. So a very simple way to get in contact with some kind of a higher guidance within yourself. Be proactive. And, and so those were the six uh, learning to recognize and respond to error in, the, in culture. Now, this one is for Forbes, and this was August 16th of 2011, so we're looking at nine years ago. And it happens to be understanding U.S. politics in four easy bullet points. And this was by Kenneth Raposa, senior contributor for Markets. And his tag is, I write about business and investing in emerging markets. And, and it, it highlights here that this article is more than nine years. I think it's interesting that it puts there. But 
Okay, let's read this a little bit. On Tuesday, Starbucks Corporation CEO Howard Schultz called on business leaders to stop funding political campaigns until Congress stops the partisan bickering. Whoa, this was nine years ago. This wasn't today. <laughs> Times don't change, do they? A CNBC poll on political donations in light of the debt uh, debate fiasco last month showed that 89% of respondents agreed with Schultz. Shortly after, CNBC showed a comment by political commentator Robert Reich saying that the reason companies contribute to U.S. politicians is because they see it as an investment. With that in mind, will Schultz's view prevail? Unlikely. Here is the best way to understand U.S. politics in four bullet points, according to Forbes. Republicans and Democrats both play to, to the rich 1% and to the following industries. Big oil, who makes the news? Here we go, big oil, big pharma, defense contractors, banking and insurance. Anybody have any shocks there? Something like a fireman, police, teachers, librarians, not included in this 1%. Republicans, reading the next bullet point, either take their talking points from Fox News or say things to get picked up on Fox News, but are really laser focused on bullet number one. So yes, in the episode I posted earlier today regarding um, the debate between Biden and Trump that we will be having in a few hours, we talked about if you turn on uh, Fox on one channel and CNN on the next, as those were the two in the list right next to each other. The fact checking, as an example, the which facts are, are chosen to be fact checked and what information is provided as far as the fact check is not necessarily checking a set of facts that people agree upon, but what it is doing is there's been a narrative created by each party and the fact checking is making sure that the facts stay in line with that narrative and in fact reshape it if, if there's another story or another um, information that's come to light, they'll reshape what was presented so that it sticks back in line with the narrative. Okay, bullet point number three. No matter who is elected, it is never as good or as bad as voters expect it to be. President Bush never banned abortion, and we didn't get martial law. President Obama failed to save the economy, and we didn't go socialist. Uh, okay, well, there's a point of view now that it's nine years later and where we're at today. And here's four. The vote that matters is a vote that's local, like a town hall vote for the school budget or zoning law. As a result, voting for select selectmen I wonder why it says select them in there. City council and maybe the mayor and governor matters and voting actually changes things. For Congress and the Senate, see, see points one and two. Again, play to the 1% of those main companies and where the Republicans take their bullet points. That's interesting that there isn't a, a comment here with Democrats. But um, yes, so going into this election, uh, we're seeing more and more the manipulation that's happening. It, it's very curious that the Democrats have pushed so hard for mail-in voting, not absentee voting, which has been around for years, where you, in fact, I went ahead and re-registered to see the process and to make sure that I didn't have any problems voting. And in order to do so, I had to answer questions that confirmed who I was, I had to present my ID, and I had to give authorization, authorization in California for the, the voting, um, the voting district, and I, don't, I can't think of the name right now, to go ahead and check with DMV in order to confirm my ID and confirm my signature that would be expected to show up on my ballot. And this is very, very different than the Democrats pushing to just mass mail ballots out to every address and, and see what they, they can get back. We also saw on the news over the last two days, um, a lot of harvesting as they refer to a ballot, specifically in the Minnesota area, addressing specific um, 
representatives. And uh, we won't go into the detail here as that story is still playing out, uh, but it's, it's very well known. I think the federal government allows an individual to collect no more than three ballots. I could be off on that number, but I, it was either um, up to three, including themselves, or up to three total, and they can't collect more. And these ballot harvesters had were boasting about having more than 300 in their car at a time that they had harvested along the way. So the next um, paragraph here, CNBC, Squawk on the Street, host asks why Schultz was making these statements and not bigger name CEOs in particular. They asked why executives like Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan Chase, CEO banking, are not coming forward to complain about Washington too. After all, lack of confidence in Congress has been something nearly every every average trader and money manager in the market has been talking about all summer long, including interviews here at Forbes. For that, see bullet number one. I'm not a politician and I'm not here to prescribe policy, but as a businessman who employs over 100,000 people, I want to see congressional leadership, Schultz told CNBC Tuesday morning. We have a profound crisis of confidence in America and that problem stems from Washington. Well, since that point, there's been quite a bit uh, a backup with Schultz. And let's just see if he's still CEO of Starbucks. And so it, it's looking that Howard Schultz might be no longer and Kevin Johnson, maybe. So let me dig into this a little bit more and see if it says here, born education, occupation, years, Starbucks, not worth, term. Well, I'd, I'm not going to go through and read this whole thing right here, but you might see on the screen faster than I do. I don't believe he is still the CEO. And, um, and that would be interesting what kind of support was garnered after such a statement, but kudos to him for standing up in this arena. Now, here we go. I continue with my discernment, and we've got americamagazine.org. And once again, it, more on the religious side, this is the Jesuit review. Pope Francis urges bishops to teach Catholics discernment on voting and politics. And this was this year, January 20th, 2020, heading into the election. Now, what is a church teaching about discernment on voting and politics? It's very interesting um, to hear comments of individuals who are in the sanctuary and hearing that the pulpit is definitely directing in, in one direction and one direction only. So whose discernment is that? Vatican City, sometimes the political choices people face can seem like a choice between supporting a snake and supporting a dragon. But Pope Francis told a group of U.S. bishops their job is to step back from a partisan politics and help their faithful discern based on values. And I'm sure that those values are discerned for them in order to make the process um, e even easier. Now here we've got another one, and again, it happens to be religious, Kenneth Copeland uh, Ministries, and it's at kcm.org. And this is, what is discernment and how should we use it under their title of faith? And they've got it as a, a learning module here. What do they have? Let's see, they have get started, believe, speak, pray, learn, and apply. And this says discernment in a word you often hear in um, is a word you often hear in Christian circles. But what does it really mean? And how are we supposed to use it? Find out more here. As Christians, we often hear the word discernment referred to as something we should expect to experience and use on a regular basis. It is a tool we've been given to help us operate with our spiritual eyes and ears and to make right choices. Philippians 1, 9 says, And this I pray, and that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Would not necessarily have chosen that, um, but 
I didn't mention the word, so there you go. So what exactly is discernment? One, in other translations, um, two, discernment is a knowing that can sometimes feel similar to a gut instinct, but it does not originate with us. It can often be a warning from God if we sense pride, perversion, occultism, or any other form of evil, our spirits will grow uncomfortable. We may not know exactly what is wrong with the person or his message, but we will sense danger and warn others to stay away from it. Now, as a child, my stomach would hurt an awful lot. And in fact, it would be debilitating. And it, the stomach pain would get so bad that it would actually transform into migraines where I'd have to sit in a dark closet with no sound and, and no light in order to, I guess, reduce the environmental stress. But looking back, as a child, we are put into a world and we are given to educators and then maybe into Sunday school classrooms or whatever it is. But we've got all these people that are taller than us telling us what to believe. And on one level or another, it's propaganda. Whether or not they believe it, maybe they haven't even thought about the words they're using, or maybe they really do have an agenda. But we are often not encouraged to question what is being taught. We might question uh, how we can apply it, but we're not encouraged to question, is this truthful? Is this, but, but you know what our bodies do. So I go back to, my stomach would hurt so bad. And now I look back as an adult to those moments and I realize I got through childhood. I was not a, a problem child. I sat and listened. I was an ideal student. And I was that because I didn't listen to my stomach. There, If I would have been the one to speak out and say, hey, I don't think this is right, or here's the alternative facts that I learned. And there were other students that I went to school with who did challenge everything. And looking back, they were ostracized or told to sit in the corner or leave the classroom. And I, I realized now that it wasn't necessarily that they were wrong. They had learned something else, probably from their parents, that were teaching them another path of life. And it was being challenged in the classroom. And yet their parents were not there to hear it. Now, my mom also recites a story, one of the 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 courses that we go through usually in about fifth grade there's a segment on understanding our bodies and how they relate to others and I know there's other terms for that but my mom wanted to know what was going to be shown to to my brother who was two years younger than me and the school very much obliged and let her come in and see the video and and there were some things in it she wasn't 100 percent comfortable with but decided it would be okay for my brother to watch it and yet when my brother came home, he relayed a totally different video. So she found out going back to the school that yes, in fact, the video they show the parents is different than the video that's showing to, shown to the students. Which brings me to today. In, in what we're facing with, um, with COVID and the school shutdowns, parents are finally getting to see a little bit more about the propaganda that's being it's not even shared, but pushed upon our children. In fact, my cousin related just a horrific, horrific experience that her seven-year-old uh, went through um, just, just two weeks ago, where the school presented a slideshow, and I have the slideshow up in front of me right here, and it, it, this particular um, text to me shows three different slides, and it's entitled Second Grade, what, day 11, what does it mean to protest? Many people protested in order to get their fair wages, safe working conditions, and time off work. And then it says, woke word of the day, protest. And then the writing in there is, um, is a little bit too small, but it's a bunch of hands that are very well tanned, uh, reaching up like they're reaching up for handouts or help, is an image in its own. Now, the next one, what does it mean to protest? So now we're on to slide number two. And this time, it has, again, a bunch of um, people with very, very nice tans with their hands up in the air, um, much like um, they're being arrested. And they all have masks covering their face, which we presume it's during the time of COVID. But really, it's showing them that they're 
it looks like they're being arrested and it looks like they're being silenced. Many protests are peaceful gatherings of people who are tired of injustice. Injustice is something when something is unfair. So a lot of different images that could have could have shown that. Now the third one here was the most horrific of all. What does it mean to protest? And again, this is second grade day 11. And it says here, a woke in kindergarten. So this was targeted to kindergarten, which means that it probably doesn't wasn't the seven year olds, but probably the five year olds that got this as well. And it says people who protest are called protesters. Protesters are brave. And it's um, an individual that's standing with one, one fist up in the air, and it's a dark silhouette, so you can't see much more about the description of that individual. But what you can see is the whole background of this individual is a building burning on fire, flames and smoke being labeled a protest and being told that that person is brave. And once again, it's got um, very tan skin, reaching up like they're reaching for handouts. This is not supportive of anyone. This is not supportive of, of a truth. And this certainly is um, it, it very leaning to one side. So from a point of discernment, we can look at that and realize that there's a lot more to a protest and it's very distinct from a peaceful protest specifically is very distinct from a riot. And all three of these images are more in alignment with a rioting behavior than a peaceful protest. So you and I might have discernment at this level, but what is a five-year-old expected to walk in with or a seven-year-old expected to walk in with as far as discernment? And how does that portray into a, into a, um, a family when a child is taught such behavior and encouraged for their bravery in a classroom. So what does not fall under the heading of discernment? When you are discerning and judging between right and wrong, this is for your protection and wise decision making. But it is also a call to intercession. It is not a call to fault finding. Number two, discernment should not result in being suspicious of others. You can receive warnings in the spirit and judge who you should spend time with, but it should not result in your feeling suspicious of everyone you meet or finding something bad in every person. Three, it is not judging others while refusing to judge yourself. We are called to examine ourselves. 1 Corinthians 11, 28, to keep from judging others. Matthew 7, 11, 7 1, and to walk in humility. Ephesians 4.2, like any other ability given to us by God, it can be abused. How is discernment different from the discerning of spirits? So we can continue this if you'd like, and of course, I'll leave the, the link for you. How do you use discernment in your life? So here's some explorations on how you can apply that. And so this was discernment, art of knowing the truth. As I mentioned, this definitely the research pulled from a religious uh, perspective, but there's so many ways to apply this into our lives with the uh, education system, um, religion in itself, whether or not we're discerning about the religious choices we're allowing in our lives. Uh, politics, definitely uh, top of hand, specifically on this day, the first day of the 2020 presidential debates. How you handle your money, where you trust the savings of your money. Discernment just plays out in many areas of life. How about the partners we pick and the friends we choose? I hope there's some clues in here to help you research further onto how to develop discernment in yourself and exercise that muscle every day. And remember the, the reference I gave you to the drinking water. Again, it's very, very simple. If you don't have another method for going into silence or meditation or prayer, then just take a glass of water, fill it whatever amount with water. When you get in bed, drink half of it, put the other half by your bed. You've asked yourself a question that you'll let your subconscious think through and work through for the night. And then in the morning, drink the other half of the water and you get a pen and paper and, and write out what 
comes to you or just sit in silence for a few minutes and let the ideas flow. And let's say the first couple of times you don't get an immediate response, or, that's okay, we have to practice this too. I find that most of my answers come in a walk. I walk every morning and every evening. And during that time, I walk in silence. I usually prefer to walk alone. And as I'm walking, I just sit and listen. And if I have a question, I'll ask my question. And the answers are almost always revealed. Again, thank you very much. I'm loving hearing the comments. I hope this was very supportive for you as we move into the election and we choose what is right for us, what is right for community, what is right for command, our, our family, and is right for the world. This is episode 121, The Art of Knowing Truth, Discernment.